Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Thank you, and welcome to the first chapel of summer school. And the first week of summer school, talking about intense experiences in summer school, uh, I'm with 40 other students along with uh, Doug Rosenau and Deb Deb Taylor here, and uh, we're doing a 40-hour, three-credit course on human sexuality. And by lunch today, we'll be halfway through it. Now, that's intense, okay? So uh, if any of you want to come and sit in on any classes uh, when you're not in class this week, we'd, we'd welcome you to do that. I, I want to take this time to talk about the gospel. And uh, I'm, I'm more excited about the gospel now at almost 58 uh, than I was at, you know, seven when I first accepted the gospel. And so I, w- I wanted us to talk about that. Let me start off reading a uh, couple of passages This is one of my favorite passages on the gospel, uh, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Okay, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And I'd also like to read another passage, and we'll let you kind of have these to go back to after chapel today and reflect on a little more. Uh, Romans 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, I had the great privilege and rich legacy of growing up as a preacher's kid, as a Southern Baptist preacher's kid uh, in Long Island, New York. And I was calculating last night, I think there's probably a pretty good chance by the time I graduated from high school, uh, I had probably heard over 2,000 explanations of the gospel. I think there's a pretty good chance of that. Uh, At the age of seven... I accepted the gospel, and I was really excited about it then. I can still remember the event and the time, the setting, and I remember even being able to embrace that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that that gave me a new spiritual freedom. And I was especially aware at that age Uh, because I remember in our neighborhood, a plane had crashed and it landed in a house and killed everybody in the house. And so I was kind of thinking about, wow, what happens when that happens to you? And so I was keenly aware that I had a new eternal destination in line for me because, not of anything of me, but because I had a new position in Christ, a new spiritual freedom. It was incredible. It still is. Um, What I'd like us to do is to uh, pray together today that we would be more gripped by the gospel and the power of it. Uh, And yes, about our spiritual freedom in Christ, but I'd like to also emphasize a little more about a new and important sociological freedom and psychological freedom that we have through the gospel that we experience now, here, in time and space, before we get to heaven. Now, let me say a little more about this. Um, In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, See if I can flip the page here. 
Um, Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, how do I get this sense of a sociological freedom that we get from the gospel? You know, every one of us need this. And in our natural and automatic way of living in life, even if we're totally squared away on where we're going after we die, we have this automatic response of responding to groups with a pecking order. We all have our place. Uh, there's, there's a group that we would place ourselves above, and there's a group that we would maybe place ourselves below. But we all have this response of saying, those guys. No matter where you are, it's interesting, isn't it? A great example is when uh, the disciples were talking about Christ, and um, they reflect the pecking order because the, uh, the disciples were saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay? And so the, the people who were saying that were from Galilee. But the people from Jerusalem would be saying, can anything good come out of Galilee? So, I mean, we're all in this, uh, you know, we, they, them thing. Now, uh, the gospel is totally putting us all on level ground. There's no group any more in need of the gospel than any other group. I love going to church every Sunday now uh, because I get a visual picture of this that really drives this home for me. The, uh, the way that our worship space is arranged is the focus is the communion table. And there's a altar uh, kneeling altar, large, that goes all the way around. And each Sunday, every follower of Christ, row by row, comes forward and they kneel at the altar. And with head bowed and hands open, you get to see all different groups represented. You see the young and the old, the strong and the weak, even the infirmed. Uh, you have the rich and the poor. Uh, you have one race and another race. You have the down and outers and the do-gooders. Every single group is equally in need of God's grace. And visually, you get to see each group represented kneeling with head bowed and hands open to be receivers of the grace that only comes from God. There's not one of us in any group that has the edge over any other group. As someone has says, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We need to remember that. We need to let the gospel give us that sociological freedom that we don't slide into the those guys approach. Let me say a word about the psychological freedom. And I'd like to look at Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now, how do we get this psychological freedom? You know, even though we may be very set on what the gospel is and even our own eternal destination with the gospel, you might even be teaching a course on the gospel. Um, but how does that impact how you're living now in time and space? Do you have a psychological freedom that comes from the gospel? Because what we're also automatically and naturally prone to do, even if we're headed to heaven, is we take the gifts of God and we use them. We even worship them 
as the things that become our source of okayness. Our legitimate, God-wired psychological needs of significance and security, um, we tend to automatically turn to the things of God to try to address those needs. Now, um, what's a great illustration of this? I like the movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, some of you may have uh, seen the reruns of this on TV lately. We saw it. And um, there's two British sprinters, Harold Abrams and Eric Little. And uh, they're sprinting, and they're sprinting for the gold in the 1924 Olympics in Paris. Um, they're both gifted. They're both fast. They're both going for the gold. Um, but there's two very different things about them, and that is they have different master motives that are driving them. When Harold Abrams was interviewed, he says, when that gun goes off, I've got 10 seconds to prove my existence. What did Eric Little say about it? He said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. You see, they both take their gifts, and they're both enjoying their gifts. They both have pleasure from their gifts, but they're using them for very different motives. Eric Little is using his gifts as a praise for his Savior. Whether he wins or lose, even though he's striving to win, it doesn't change his psychological needs being met by the source of God. The gospel frees him in his endeavors. Harold Abrams is using his gifts to become his savior. I've got 10 seconds to prove my existence. Now, all of us have gifts. Um, I love to bike, as Chaplin said. And God made me fast. I am so fast on the bike. The name of my bike is Light Speed. <laughs> okay? Now, I can enjoy that as a gift from God, and when I go fast, I can feel his pleasure. And it can be for the praise and glory of God. Or I can be tempted and am often tempted to use my gift as a source of my okayness. If I'm feeling my little significance is down, security's down a little, uh, I can actually worship a gift of God rather than God himself. Now, guess what? All of you do the same thing. We're all gifted in many different ways. You may be uh, an amazing preacher, teacher, exegete. Whatever it is that God, you may blow the trumpet like Chaplain Bill, okay? Uh, it's a good news, bad news thing. The good news is it's from God, and you can do it with pleasure and for his glory. The bad news is, is you can worship the gift. It's the gospel that gives us psychological freedom, that we are compelled out of the love of Christ to serve him uh, rather than to worship his gifts. Think about this. Maybe you'd reflect on these passages some. Uh, especially consider the giftedness that God has given you. Uh, and how does the gospel give you a psychological freedom as well as a sociological freedom, along with your spiritual freedom? Let's pray together. Father God, you are so good. And we are so thankful for your grace in our lives. We are so thankful that salvation, our true potential to know you and to be with you, is only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And the ground is truly level at the foot of the cross. We have no basis of elevating ourselves over anyone else, any other group. And we know that our legitimate needs of significance and security are only truly met in you and not in your gifts. I pray today 
that you would have us think more deeply and to be grasped more firmly by your gospel, that we would live now in time and space more free with your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.